Debbie mentioned this is a, sort of an unusual situation. We went through the book of 1 Thessalonians. We took six weeks. We went line by line, verse by verse. And this is normally a break week. And then I start a new series next week, a series called Next Step. But uh, I thought we would extend this out one more week because Paul wrote a second letter to the Thessalonians. He wrote it just a few months later. And it deals mostly with the second coming of Christ. Now, I want to just start by saying this. If you happen to be here this morning and it's your first time being here, this is, this is not the normal sort of message that I give. This is going to be very detailed. I'm going to have to go kind of fast, and I would urge you to sort of, um, don't even try to take notes, but get the CD or the DVD if you want to restudy some of these things for yourself. But it's going to be an awful lot like a teaching message, a little bit different than the usual style. And if you're here for the first time, you may think that uh, I am perhaps the craziest guy you've ever heard in your life by the time this message is over with. So, of course, you that are here regularly, you know that I'm the craziest guy. <laughs> so it doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> but, um, you know, a little review. You know, we said that Paul had written this out of his 13 letters that he wrote in the New Testament. This was his second writing. It was in around 51 A.D. And uh, you can read all about the, the planting of the church in Acts chapter 17, 1 through 9. But a, a central theme of his message to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians and today in 2 Thessalonians is the second coming of Christ. Now, this is an interesting thing because the truth of the matter is you could go to churches in America and actually not only in America, all over the world, you could go to churches 10, 20 years and frankly never hear a message on the second coming of Christ, at least not in any way that's in any sort of a detailed uh, fashion or in any way that it's a serious teaching. But the truth is, is that 300 times in the New Testament the second coming of Christ is mentioned. In fact, in communion or the Lord's Supper, every time you do that, it's connected to the, the second coming of Christ. We'll, we'll celebrate communion today, something we do about every six weeks. We'll do that today too. But about one in every 30 verses in the New Testament talks about the second coming of Christ. Clearly, God wants his people to understand it he wants his people to live in light of it. He wants it to motivate us and to strengthen us and so forth. But uh, to do that, excuse me, somebody's disoriented back there. That, um, okay, all right. Um, to do that, we have to understand what the scripture says about it. So um, again, bear with me. I'm going to have to go fast, a lot of details, mostly teaching, a little bit different style. And for you that are visiting, you will think I'm crazy probably. But let's go to 2 Thessalonians now. And that'll be page 837 or 1172 in those Bibles that are near you on the chair. And, and please do follow along with me. I mean, I really want you to know the scripture for yourself. The Bible is not beyond your ability to understand. It really isn't. I mean, that's my heart's desire is that you'll have clarity. You'll have certainty. You'll see for yourself what God has revealed to us. By the way, as you're turning there, the Bible stands alone in being unique of every other religious writing on the planet in this regard. About one-third of the Bible is predictive prophecy, meaning that God predicts the future about certain men, certain nations, certain events, very specific, easy to track. And these are fulfilled again and again and again. In Jesus' first coming alone, uh, there was probably as many as 300 scriptures that predicted the way he would come and what he would be like and so on. There's many more that talk about the second coming of Christ. But when you read every other religious writing there is, if they have a prophetic, a predictive, prophetic element at all, it's very minute and it's vague. It usually has something to do with, well, at the end of time there will be judgment or something like that. But the Bible is very different. It talks about specific men and cities and nations and these things can be tracked and traced. And by the way, the Bible says the way you really test a prophet, a true prophet, a prophet of God in Deuteronomy 18, it says if it's a true prophet... The test is 100% accuracy. And in fact, in the Old Testament, if a person was not 100% accurate and claimed to be a prophet, God told his people, take them out and stone them because they are a false prophet. And so we have to, you know, have a clear understanding of how protective God is about his word. All right, we have a lot of ground to cover, so uh, let's turn to 2 Thessalonians. And remember, the second coming of Christ was a major theme in chapter 4 and 5 of 1 Thessalonians. He picks that up again so let's start in chapter 1, but let's drop down to verse 6. The Apostle Paul says, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. Remember, the Thessalonians were being persecuted because of their faith in Christ. He says, God will trouble those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven 
in blazing fire with his powerful angels. And we'll just kind of stop there. But here Paul immediately introduces the second coming of Christ again. Now, mind you, he's written them the first letter, and now it's two or three months later, he's writing them back again. He has evidently found that they're a little bit confused still about the second coming of Christ. Evidently, you'll see in a minute, someone had either given a prophecy, a false prophecy, or someone had written a letter saying that the second coming had already occurred and they had somehow missed it and they were, they were alarmed, they were unsettled, they were obviously you know, concerned about it. But he says that when Christ comes back, he comes back with his angels in blazing fire. It's a time of judgment for those that reject God, want nothing to do with his way and will and design. But it's a time, if you read on in those verses on your own, some time of, of blessing and restoration for those that have put their faith in Christ and are following him. And by the way, everybody alive is following somebody. Uh, you know, uh, we're either following ourselves because we think that our ideas about life are best or we're following somebody else or some other philosophy or, or ideology or something. I believe that Christ is the most valid person to follow in the universe. I think he's proven himself to be the most trustworthy. So everybody's following somebody. We're either following Christ or maybe ourselves or somebody else. But anyway, he's writing to these followers of Christ He's concerned about they might be confused about the second coming. Now let's pick up in chapter 2, verse 1. And this is where we're going to spend the concentration of our time, albeit, as I said, I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. It's going to be uh, a lot of detail that get the CD, DVD, and you can study on your own. Anyway, here we go. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. Notice those things are simultaneous. When Christ comes, we that are followers of Christ are gathered to him. He talked about that in chapter 4. The trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ rise, and we who are alive and remain are caught up to be with Christ in the air. In Matthew 24, 31, Jesus said specifically when he comes in the air, it is his angels that gather out his own. Uh, so it's the angels that actually bring the living up to meet with Christ in the air. He says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy or report or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Pause for a minute. You have some terms that are used interchangeably here. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, our gathered together to him, the day of the Lord. They're all talking about the exact same event. The day of the Lord is the time when Christ comes visibly, physically, and it is at that time that we are gathered together with him. The day of the Lord is referenced all through the Old Testament. It's always a time when God's judgment comes to earth. It's a time when the earth has reached a stage of incorrigibility. In other words, those that uh, are reached are reached and those that just can't be, God is going to bring judgment and finally right um, the world and the universe. But anyway, the day of the Lord is the time when Christ returns. It's a time when God's own or Christ's own are gathered together to him. Let's pick up in verse three. Now, he first didn't want them to be alarmed, and I'm going to backtrack on this in a bit, but the second thing in verse 3, he says, don't let anyone, and what is the word? Deceive you. Don't let anyone deceive you. He didn't want them to be alarmed. He didn't want them to be deceived about the second coming. God doesn't want us to be alarmed about the second coming. He doesn't want us to be deceived about it. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day will not come until the rebellion, that word rebellion, it's in the original language, the Greek apostasia, it means the falling away from the faith. That day will not come until the apostasia or the rebellion or the falling away from faith occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. Listen to a further description of this man. Verse four, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshiped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, Paul says to the Thessalonians, first of all, that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, the day of the Lord, will not occur until this man of lawlessness who claims to be God enters into God's temple and claims to be God until he is revealed. Now, I just want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever heard, ever heard a teaching that says that, you know what, um, Jesus could just come at any time. I mean, you, know, you better be ready because he could just come at any time. I'm just curious. How many have heard that teaching? Let's see your hands. It's pretty common. That verse completely says that that's incorrect. 
Look, look at it with, with just open, objective eyes. He says, again, he says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become, become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy report or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. That day will not come. Could that be more clear? I mean, is, is that clear, everybody? That day, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, our being gathered to him, will not come until... And then he tells us what's got to happen first. Until this man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction, he'll oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Now, when the Thessalonians heard this, they were crystal clear what Paul was saying because there was only one temple that any mind would turn to in this day. It wouldn't be one of the, the temples of some of the gods and goddesses. He knew he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem. The temple that was originally built by Solomon in 972 B.C. It was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. It was rebuilt in 516 B.C. And then in Jesus' day, Herod had spent eight years gathering materials and then another 20 years with 10,000 men on the construction of the temple. The, the temple was there, but the grounds needed to be expanded. And here's why. Three times a year, God required that all the males would come and, and meet in Jerusalem together to worship. It was at uh, Passover and Pentecost and the Feast of Tabernacles. And so Jerusalem, which normally had about 100 to 200,000 people living in it, at this season, at these spring seasons, these spring festivals, all of a sudden it would swell to one million people packed into this little city. And so Herod... Uh, a forward-thinking guy, he decided to do this major build-out. And so he built this gigantic plaza. It's literally over 20 football fields large so that literally a million people could function on these special feasts. This thing was magnificent. It was white marble, the temple. It was uh, covered on the tops with gold. It had a bronze door. People said that in the daytime when the sun would hit it, you couldn't look at it. It would blind you literally because of the glow that would come off it. The columns, there are 162 columns in this temple. These columns, you could get three men with their arms stretched out like this trying to encircle it and three men could just barely encircle these 100, 162 of these columns. They were 30 feet high. They were, they were magically decorated with this Corinthian capping at the top. This thing was looked upon as one of the wonders of the world. When he said the temple of God Everyone knew what he was talking about, particularly these that he had been teaching about Christ. And so here's Paul telling these Thess Thessalonians, and that temple was still standing when he said this. He said, listen, you need to be aware of this. This may seem impractical, but it's very practical because if, if this personage comes forward and goes into God's temple in Jerusalem that was still standing and declares himself as God, He's saying, that's, that's a real dangerous trigger point. You need, to, you need to be aware of this. I don't want you to be confused about this, he's saying. Now, let's ask ourselves today. Do we have to be concerned today, right now, this minute, that this could be fulfilled? The answer is no. Because what happened is this. In A.D. 70, about 40 years after Jesus said it would occur, the Romans, under Titus, they came into Jerusalem. They completely destroyed the temple. The temple stones averaged like 10 tons of stone. Some of them were as much as 400 tons. Titus and his army came in. They completely destroyed the temple in 70 AD. And Israel ceased to be a nation. They, they went in, into extinction in 70 AD. They never existed as a nation again until 1948. Yet the Bible had predicted all along that they would be regathered to their land, that they would recover their land, that they would regather their, regain their capital. And then in 1967, Israel fought a war and they won their capital, Jerusalem, back. And now today, and on that insert that I passed out to you guys to study on your own, there's some, there some links you can look online where there are people in Israel that are very, very serious about rebuilding this temple. They have prepared most of the things that need to go into the temple. They've prepared the priest's clothing. I saw with my own eyes where they were training priests and, and and gay, I saw the priest doing a sacrifice, a practice sacrifice on a lamb. They are very serious about building this temple. They have the blueprints, but there is a problem. Because you see, the temple site, this big plaza that Herod built, that's over 20 football fields big, 
it's the place where the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque sit. Dome of the Rock, uh, second most holy place or third most holy place to Islam. And uh, they think it's a place where um, Muhammad ascended back into heaven. So they can't even really go on the site though they own the, the city of Jerusalem, so to speak. So the temple's not there. This passage couldn't be fulfilled. This person couldn't come into the temple because the temple's not built. He could in that day. But the thing that makes this a very practical message for you and I that are alive today for the first time since 70 AD this could happen there are people planning it there are people praying for it there are people that believe it they're ready they just want the right set of circumstances and so it's, it's very important that we are aware that this is at some point maybe not in our generation in time but at some point in human history this, this is going to happen now the rest of the passage goes on to describe this, this individual a little bit. We know that he claims to be God. We know that he sets himself up in God's temple. Let's go back to verse 5. Paul says, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. You know, here again, Paul told these brand new believers this in-depth truth about the second coming of Christ. And yet, as I said earlier, there, there are folks that have gone to church their whole life long and frankly don't know much have never received much teaching about the second coming of Christ at all. That's just not right. Now, I'm not saying that we should talk about it every message, but, but God's people are meant to, to be aware of this. It's, it's called the blessed hope for us. It's meant to give us courage. It's meant to give us strength and perspective. So Paul says, hey, don't you remember when I was with you? I used to tell you these things, and you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. Now he's still talking about this figure that's going to come into the temple. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he's taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth, meaning his spoken word, and destroy by the, by the what? What does it say? The splendor of his coming. So see how this works out? This being will finally be destroyed, but it's when Christ returns physically, and that's what brings this, this being to justice, whoever he may be. So let's pause there, and then we'll pick up in a bit on the second half. The first thing Paul said to the Thessalonians, and then I want to say to you, because I'm going to say some things in this message that could be alarming, but Paul said to them then, and I'm saying to you now, don't be alarmed. If you've put your faith in Christ, if you said, I don't really give a rip what anybody else in the world does, I'm going to follow Jesus fully forever. Everybody's following somebody. I don't find anybody better to follow than Jesus. He created me. He designed me. He knows the laws of my nature. He loves me more than I love myself. He knows what's best and wants what's best. I'm going to follow him. If you've put your faith in Christ and become his follower, the Bible is very clear. It says all your sins are forgiven. You are given as a gift eternal life in his kingdom and this return of Christ for you is, is the blessed hope it's not something to be feared even though some of the things that precede it are a little bit uncomfortable Paul says don't be alarmed listen to what the scripture says in Isaiah about God's ability and God's alone God's ability alone to see the future and foretell it the Lord says in Isaiah 46 8 he says remember this fix it in mind take it to heart I am God and there is no other I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come. God alone can predict the future. And the Bible, like I said, is, is alone in that regard. Listen to what Jesus said. The last night he was with his disciples, within hours, with less than 24 hours of when he says these two passages, he's going to go to the cross. But this is what he says to his disciples. He says, look, if the world hates you, he says to his followers, if the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. All this I have told you so that you will not, what does he say? Go astray. If we know in advance that we may be rejected, mocked, made fun of, we've sang about that in the song, for following Christ or worse, we're, we're prepared. He says, listen, they persecuted me. They're going to persecute you. All this I've told you so that you will not go astray. Then he goes on to say, a time is coming when anyone who, what does it say? Kills you. Not pleasant. When anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. 
The, the warning, the prophecy is meant to prepare us. Let me ask you a question. I've always wondered about this. I have never met a woman ever that doesn't know <laughs> that when she gives birth, it's going to hurt. <laughs> I've never met one that just says, whoa, what's this? You, you know, I mean, they know. They know in advance. Now, here's my question. How do they know? How, how, how do they know it's going to hurt? Because other women, evidently, tell them. No man would tell. <laughs> but other women somehow pass it on. It's going to hurt. Okay? Now, why do women tell other women that when they give birth, it's going to hurt? Are they trying to terrify them? Are they trying to make it so that they never have a baby? Uh, are, are they trying to discourage them? Are they trying to make them despondent? It's going to, listen, it's going to hurt so bad, honey, you're going to think you're going to die. You'll pull your husband's ears off, you know? <laughs> I mean, why, 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 do they, why do they tell that? Is it to discourage them? Or is it to prepare them? Listen, it's going to hurt but man, you're going to give birth to a life God has allowed we humans to bring life into the world. And so, yes, prepare yourself for the pain, but then prepare yourself for the joy that's going to come as a result of it. God tells us in advance, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Uh, Jesus called it himself. It's like birth pains building up as the new age when his return draws close. Things are going to get rough. They're going to be bumpy. Even for his most devoted followers, the Bible doesn't sugarcoat things. It's very honest. It says, you know, there's not going to be an easy ride. But it says we know in advance. And because we know in advance, we, we can trust and endure and, and take heart. So that's one of the purposes of prophecy. Another thing that we're told is that no matter what we ever face in life, if we're followers of Christ, God will give us the grace that we need, the strength that we need at the time that we need it, not before, uh, to endure whatever it is we need to go through. Listen to this passage from 1 Corinthians 10. I, I used to always call it my favorite. It was the coward's passage. You know, it's the, the, the coward's way out, sort of, so to speak. It says, no temptation, and that word temptation there in the original language, it's parasmos. It could be translated temptation or trial or testing, either one. No temptation, trial, or testing has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted or tried beyond what you can bear. Isn't that encouraging? You're not, you're, you and I are never going to face something beyond what we can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way, what does it say? Out. Now, if we just stop right there, I like it. Because it, sound, it doesn't sound good. It sounds like, you know, I get in, in, in real bad, difficulty, hard times, and I pray, and God gets me out. He gets me out of it. And occasionally we pray, and he does. I've had God get me out of things. How, how many, I'm just curious. How many have ever prayed, and God gets you out of something? All right. But then the rest of the verse, when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can, ooh, ooh, stand up under it. And I've experienced that that I don't get rescued. But God gives me strength somehow to breathe another minute, to live another hour, to eke it out another day, and he's faithful. So here we have this promise that even though the Bible is honest and it says that there's hard times coming to those that are apart from God and those that are belong to Christ, he says that you're, you are never going to face anything in life. I'm never going to face anything in life, but that God will see to it that we have the internal resources necessary to bear up under it. And that's how spiritual uh, strength is developed, by the way, by, by the pressure that we have to, you know, at times bear under. Now, don't be alarmed. That's the first part. It's what Paul said to the Thessalonians then. It's what God's saying to all of us now. The second part, Paul said, was don't be deceived. Because if we don't understand the things that are going to happen when they happen, we're going to be lost. Uh, the world is going to be deceived and there's going to be a, what the Bible calls a great delusion that's going to engulf mankind at this era just before Jesus returns. So let's pick back up reading in 2 Thessalonians and we'll pick up in verse 9. Now he's still describing this one that comes into the temple, you know, that uh, proclaims himself to be God. Verse 9, he says, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. Now, now those terms there, they're the exact same terms that are used for Jesus' signs and wonders and miracles. We're talking, here Paul is warning us, God is warning us, that this being that comes into the temple 
It's not going to be just somebody that says, oh, I'm God and has nothing to back it. It's going to be someone that comes in there with persuasive power doing the same kinds of miracles that Christ did during his three and a half year ministry. Listen, no one, no one has ever done the kind of miracles that Christ did before Jesus or after Jesus. In that three and a half year ministry, he did things that no one has ever done before or since. But Paul says this being is going to be able to do the exact same kinds of miracles that Jesus did. So that makes this person a bit convincing. But it's, it's albeit it's in satanic power. Verse 10. He says, And in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. But, but why are they perishing? They perish because they, what does it say? What does it say? You with me? Refuse, refuse to do what? They refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Now, now let this sink in for a minute. What Paul is saying is, is that when people hear the message of Christ, that God loves us and that we can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life and we can be who we were meant to be and do what we were meant to do by union with Christ, that when some people hear that message, they just go, ah, yeah, that's cool, man. If that's your deal, if it floats your boat, that's fine, but that's just not my thing. You know, I'm just, ah, you know, it's good. It's okay. You, you need that. They just don't love the truth when they hear it. They have no desire for it. It doesn't stir them. It doesn't resonate with them. And, and Paul says that's a really, really dangerous thing when people hear God's truth and it doesn't arouse uh, a positive response. He says that's what causes them to perish, that they refuse to love the truth and be saved. He goes on to say in verse 11, for this reason God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. Notice it's not just any old lie, it's the lie. There is a lie coming down the track just prior to the return of Christ, a major lie that's going to delude, it's going to, it's going to completely confuse and, and pull in all human beings who are not followers of Christ. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth. First, they didn't love the truth. Now they don't believe the truth but have delighted in what? In wickedness. You know how that goes. Some people, you know, they, they, they just have that little, that little, you know, clever snicker. They just kind of love wickedness in its various ways and it's a, it's a source of joy and spice of life and that kind of thing. And God says that's why they perish. They have no love of righteousness, no love of God, no love of, of the kingdom that Jesus is bringing. For that reason, God says, I'm going to let you to that last generation. He's going to let that generation be deceived. Now, I want to dig much deeper. Now's where we're going to get in kind of the teaching component of this. So just sort of try to hold on and um, again, get the CD or the DVD, you know, that way you can review a lot of stuff. But let's listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 24. And by the way, Matthew 24 uh, was, was five days before Jesus went to the cross. He was on the Temple Mount and then he left and explained some things to his disciples about his second coming. He talks about the destruction of the temple, but for you and I, you and I ought to be saturated with Matthew 24. We ought to read it and reread it and read it and reread it and read it and reread it. We ought to know it inside out because Jesus laid out what's going to happen before his return and what's going to happen as he returns. But in Matthew 24, verse 4, it says, Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. Well, we've heard that from Paul. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ or I am the Messiah. Notice he said, many, many will come saying, I'm the Messiah. And they will, what does it say? They'll deceive many. They'll, they'll be successful. So when you see standing in the holy place, that's the temple, the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation. And don't let that term throw you because it's going to get unpacked as this message goes on. Then there will be great distress or great tribulation unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. At that time, meaning during this terrible tribulation time, after this abomination of desolation, and by the way, that abomination of desolation in the temple, that's what we read about in 2 Thessalonians, when this being comes into the temple and declares himself as God. That's the abomination of desolation. You'll see later on he also causes the sacrifices to cease at that point. Anyway, it says, For at that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or here is the Messiah, or, or there he is. Do not believe it. Why, Jesus? Why shouldn't we believe it? Verse 24. For false Christs, plural. You've got to get that. 
false messiahs, false saviors, plural, okay, will appear. Uh, excuse me, false Christ and false prophets will appear. And what will they do? They'll perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect. That's talking about Christians. Even the elect, if that were possible. And then Jesus says in verse 25, See, I have told you ahead of time. That's the purpose of prophecy. It's to prepare us. It's to forewarn us. So here's Jesus saying that at this time in human history where there's unprecedented trouble, in fact, when you read the book of Revelation chapter 6 and the seals, there's seven seals that God begins to unfold, you find that between Revelation uh, 6 and the end of Revelation chapter 9 where you have the trumpet judgments, you literally, in a compressed period of time, probably less than three years, you have over half of the world's population gone, gone. In the beginning, because of wars and plagues and famine, one quarter of the world's population is killed off. Then because of asteroids striking the planet, what even sounds like maybe something that jolts us off our axis as a planet, and other phenomenon, you have another one-third dying. You put the one-third and one-fourth together, you have over half of the planet in a very compressed short period of time that dies. And that's why Jesus said, unless those days would be shortened, no one would survive. We're talking about a time that's never happened. The planet has never experienced such catastrophe as what is going to occur just prior to Jesus' return. And he says that during this time of catastrophe, when, when the planet is, I mean, listen, there's seven billion people right now, so wake up tomorrow morning and you only have three or three and a half. That's what it's going to be like. Massive devastation, you know, on, on the planet. And he says at that time, these, these false Christs or these false messiahs will appear and they will have supernatural power, the same kind that Jesus himself demonstrated. And one of them in particular will stand in the temple and say that I'm your creator I'm your God, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unfold or unpack that a bit more as we go on, but, but let that much soak in. Now, there's a trigger to these things, and uh, the first one is a heavenly trigger. Now, mind you, Jesus has talked about these things, you know, the, the way this period of human history is going to unfold, but there's something that starts in heaven before we receive the impact on earth. Listen to what it says in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 20. This is the Lord speaking. He says, Go, my people, enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. And then he says something significant. Hide yourselves for a little while. This is God talking to his people at a particular time in human history that had not occurred in Isaiah's day, hadn't occurred yet for you and I. He says, Hide yourselves for a little while until his, and what is the word? His wrath. Keep that in mind. You're going to see that word again and again. Until his wrath has passed. He's talking about this future time in human history where God is going to say enough and he's going to judge the heavenly beings that have rebelled against him as well as those on earth that have become incorrigible. He says, hide yourselves though to his faithful people. He says, there's a time coming when we have to be ready to hide ourselves for a little while until his wrath has passed. See, the Lord is coming out of his dwelling. We read about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, that Jesus comes out of his dwelling, as were, with his angels in flaming fire. It says that the Lord is coming out of his dwelling to punish the people of the earth for their sins. Isaiah 24, 21 talks about this exact same period. It says, in, the day of the, in that day, the Lord will punish, now get this, the powers in the, where? In the heavens above. That's the angelic species that have rebelled against God. We learn later on that that's one-third of them that have rebelled. He's going to punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. Now, verse 22 is really interesting. They, meaning the spiritual beings, the rebel angels above, and the kings on the earth below, they will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. Where are they herded together? on the earth listen to this Jesus says there's going to be this time with all this upheaval this abomination of desolation and then he says and look out when that happens these false Christs doing miracles are going to appear here God says in Isaiah a time is coming where he's going to judge and punish 
the high rebels, the spiritual rebels, the angelic rebels, and he's going to bring them down and herd them together, as it were, like in a dungeon. But where, is that, where are they going to be herded? It's going to be right here on earth. L- listen to how the scripture gets more clear about this. Revelation, last book of the Bible, chapter 12, verse 9. L- listen to what it says. Don't let this throw you this dragon stuff. It, it'll explain itself. The dragon was hurled down. Notice, that's thrown. That's forced down. The dragon was hurled down. Well, who, who's the dragon? The ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled where? To the earth. This has not happened yet. This has not happened. In Isaiah, where does he say he's going to take them and bring them down with the kings of the earth, as it were in a dungeon, on the earth? Satan is hurled down to the earth and his angels with him. Now the Bible is clear. It says that one third of the angels rebelled against God. There, there could be billions of them. We don't know. We don't know. It could be a smaller number, but there's some hints that there's a lot of them. But what you've got to see is there's a period and time coming where Satan and his angels that are now functioning in an invisible dimension, they are forced out of that invisible dimension and they are thrown down here from above. They come down to the earth. It's the fulfillment of Isaiah where he says they're going to be herded together. He's going to mete out the punishment on these spiritual beings on earth, but they're going to probably take on or be forced to take on physical form at that point. We have a precedent in Genesis chapter 6, verse, verse 1 through 4, where the flood was about to come on the earth in Noah's day. It says, The sons of God, the angels, saw the daughters of men, and they came down and they mated with them, and they had freakish hybrid offspring called the Nephilim. Um, we know angels can take physical form. You can read about it in your own Bible. The, the records are all over the world about those that from above came down, the Sumerians, the most ancient records we have, they talk about the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki means those who from above came down. They were called the gods and created the race of man is what they say in some of these legends. But the Bible says a time is going to occur. And when we allegorize these things, it could leave us terribly, terribly unprepared. Some of the things I'm saying, I know they sound so weird, so science fiction like, but the scripture backs these things that there's going to come a time when Satan and his angels are forced into the physical dimension they come to earth let's read on he says they were hurled uh, he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him therefore verse 12 rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you he is filled with fury because he knows that his time is what and you'll see exactly how much time he has and he knows and you will know after today how much time he has Jesus picking up on that same exact situation he says in Matthew 24 read it again Jesus answered watch out that no one deceives you at that time if anyone says to you look here's the Messiah or here's the Christ or there he is do not believe it for false Christs or false messiahs, false saviors, plural, and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. What I'm suggesting is that when Satan and his angels are forced down, they come down from above to the earth in the form of saviors, false messiahs, false Christ. They come at a time when the world is in the worst chaos it's ever been in. Jesus said the time is so severe that if it weren't shortened, nobody'd survive. Half the planet has been killed off. And they come to save us. And they prove that they're superior beings, more highly of all beings, whatever lie they float, by being able to do the same kinds of supernatural things that Jesus himself did. And they claim to be here to save us. That's why Jesus says, look out, look out when those times come and they say oh no Jesus has returned he's over here he's over there no it says when he comes he's going to fill the sky his angelic army with him and there will be no mistaking who's who now I want to throw something out and you'll you jot this down look it up on your own not now but in Revelation 19 19 in Revelation 19 19 or in Revelation 19 you have Christ actually returning with his armies of heaven returning to earth But in verse 19 of chapter 19, you have something that is so strange that it's almost unimaginable. 
And what you have is this, that when Christ and his invading army from the sky is coming back, Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24, him and his angels and the saints, those that believe with him. We read about it in 1 Thessalonians. When they come back from the sky, what you have in Revelation 19, 19 is the armies of the world all gathered and prepared for this invasion and they are ready to fight this invading army from the sky. When, when you read that, it is the strangest thing imaginable. How could you convince the armies of the world to unite? And where did they get the notion? How did they know this invasion was coming? I'm going to kind of answer that because I think the scripture answers it. But in Revelation 19, 19, the armies of the world are poised to fight Jesus and his angels as he returns. Um, so anyway, we've looked at the heavenly trigger. There's a time when God's going to judge Satan and the fallen angels. At that time, they will be forced to the earth. And that's the time when they're, I believe they're going to take on this form of these false messiahs and false Christs that are going to fill our planet and deceive many. Jesus says, so convincing will they be that, that it almost deceives even the elect. One of them will go into that Jewish temple rebuilt and say, I'm actually your creator. I was here a couple thousand years ago. Maybe he'll say, you called me Jesus then. But we're all the Christ. We're all the saviors. But I'm the leader of all. He comes to the temple and declares himself as God. Now, that's the heavenly trigger. Let's look at the earthly trigger. Jesus has mentioned it, but let's review it again. In Matthew 24, verse 15. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, 2 Thessalonians explains what that is. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. That's the abomination of desolation. You're going to see that causes the, the sacrifices that have been reinstituted uh, once this temple is rebuilt to cease. Daniel, writing some 500 years before Jesus, describes this same personage. Listen to what it says in Daniel 11.36. He calls him a king. This person has political power. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and say unheard of things against who? The god of gods. So this being who's going to claim to be God is also going to say terrible things about the true God. He's going to say unheard of things about the god of gods. And he will be, what does it say? Successful. Successful. People are going to buy it. People are going to buy it. He will be successful, that is, until the time of what? The time of wrath is what? Completed. This time of wrath. This will be on the CD, DVD, so you don't have to write it down. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 17, we have a reference to the starting of God's wrath. Okay? Then when you get to Revelation 15, 1, we have the completion of God's wrath. And you have it being poured out in the, the final seven bold judgments on the earth. This passage that Daniel says that this being who exalts himself above God and says horrible things about the true God will be successful until the time of wrath is complete. We've read about that time of wrath earlier where it says the Lord is coming at that time. Let's read on a little more. For what has been determined must take place. Verse 31, his armed forces, so he has, he has an army, his armed forces will rise up to desecrate the what? There it is, the temple, the temple fortress. And will abolish what? The daily sacrifice. Like I told you, I saw with my own eyes on YouTube, of all places, the Jewish priest practicing a, the sacrifice of a lamb. I saw that this year. They are very serious about this. It's not taking place yet. But this being abolishes the sacrifice. That's the abomination of desolation. It happens when he comes into the temple claiming that he's God. But look at what it says about the faithful followers of Christ. It says, but the people who know their God, it's important that we really know God, the people who know their God will do what? Firmly resist him. They're not going to be whisked away somewhere. We're going to be right here as followers of Christ firmly resisting him, I hope all of us. And it goes on to tell exactly how we firmly resist. It says, then those who are wise will, what does it say? 
instruct many. That's how we'll resist. We'll be here saying, that's not the real God. Those aren't real Christ. The real Christ is coming, and we can even tell you approximately when he's going to be here. We're really close, but those are false prophets and false Christ, and that's how we will resist. We'll firmly resist, and some of us, you'll see in the verse that comes, we'll pay a price. It goes on to say this, those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword that's just biblical terminology for being put to death or burned or captured meaning we'll be imprisoned or plundered we'll have all of our goods taken for resisting the authority now the book of revelation gives us another picture another snapshot of the exact same earthly trigger event but this time this being that comes into the temple is called the beast revelation 13 5 it says the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words. We've heard that before. Blasphemies and to exercise authority for how long? 42 months. It's three and a half years. Keep that in mind. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. Remember what I said about Revelation 19, 19. How how in the world do you get the armies of the world to coordinate and they know it's coming they know Christ and his invading army is coming and they are prepared to fight him as he comes from the sky how do you get the armies of the world to do that there's the answer this being will slander it says the name of God he'll slander his dwelling place meaning heaven and he'll slander those who live in heaven with him in other words he will say that we're the good guys that have come to save you we've come from above down but there's bad guys that are coming too and so we want to help you prepare to fight them he's going to convince the world that Christ and his armies are the bad invaders from above and that that's how they get them ready to uh, to fight and they know when Jesus is coming they're, they're pretty much prepared in Revelation 19 19 so he slanders his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven and then verse 7 he was given power to make war against the who? And that word saints there, it doesn't mean some special meritorious person. It is used for ordinary imperfect believers all through the New Testament. It's a Greek word, hagias. It just means those that are set apart devotees unto Christ. That's me, that's you if you're a Christian. He's given power to make war against us as followers of Christ and to, what does it say? Conquer. We're, we're, we're going to lose our lives in some cases. And to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. And he forced everyone, he forced, notice that, everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on the right hand or his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Then Revelation 14 says to the Christians, it says, this calls for the patient endurance of, on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and what? Remain faithful to Jesus. Why is it going to be so hard to remain faithful to Jesus? Listen, if you don't get the mark, you can't buy food. You have nowhere to live. You'll get, what's happened? The world is in disarray. These false Christs come down. They say, we're going to redistribute the world's wealth. We're going to care for everybody. But we have to globalize. We have to unify. We have to get everybody united. And we're going to give everybody some drawing rights here. But you have to have an identifying mark that you're loyal to the new global government to save mankind. And when Christians say, that's a lie, don't take it, don't take the mark, the Christians will not be able to buy or sell, which means we'll be scrapping Uh, if we're alive for food and and survival but the scripture says endure it calls for patient endurance God tells us ahead of time so that we're not alarmed and so that we won't be deceived and listen we all know that could be extremely tempting here you have these beings that say we love you we're here to save you we're the real Christ we're the cosmic Christ we're the universal Christ we're your creators we're back to save you now there's bad beings that are coming but we want to help you guys get through this period let's all get a mark and we've got the technology now we've got the computerization to do it let's get a mark let's make sure that everybody has what they need it would be very convincing particularly when you're scared and hungry that's the earthly trigger this abomination of desolation this being that comes into the temple claiming to be God he's the beast he causes the sacrifices at the temple to stop which means they would have had to be reinstituted which means the temple would have had to be built but it doesn't exist today We also have the exact length of time that God's people will have to endure. In the book of Revelation 13.5, we've already gotten a hint. 
It says, The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for how long? Forty-two months. That's three and a half years. But Daniel, some 500 years before Jesus, he's even more specific. Listen to Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. He says, From the time the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up. Do you see the consistency of the scripture? Jesus says, the abomination that causes desolation. Look out for it. Paul says, he comes into the temple claiming to be God. Daniel had said it 500 years earlier. It's always the same event. He says, when you see this, from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. God wants his people prepared. And that's one month past three and a half years. So here it's saying that the beast kind of has his authority and he's, you know, kind of persecuting God's people for three and a half years. But if you make it past that, you know, 1,290 days, it starts getting good. But then he goes on to say something even more interesting. He says, blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. So that's like about two months more past that three and a half year period. So if we're alive and we actually see a rebuilt Jewish temple and at some point society is coming unglued where we're having wars, we're having mass casualties, we're having famine, we're having earthquakes like the planet's never seen, we're having asteroid strikes. When you see this kind of thing and then suddenly some being enters in a rebuilt Jewish temple and claims that he is God, that's the abomination of desolation and that's when we as God's people say oh we know now the deception's coming the false Christ when they start appearing we're not buying in we're not taking the mark we're not going to be deceived and we'll know okay we now have 1290 days we've got to figure out how to make it and some will and some won't the book of Revelation is very honest this is if we're destined to die during this time we will and blessed are those who die in the Lord but some of us will live through it listen Three billion people are going to make it through this thing. Uh, some followers of Christ and some not. So that's, that's in detail what this event uh, will, will take in, this day of the Lord. Now, two weeks ago I gave a message on uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and I dealt with the second coming of Christ. And I talked about how in Matthew 24 verse 31 it says that when Christ returns in blazing fire, he comes with his angels with him and it says there's a trumpet blast that his people hear, but the angels, not Jesus, it is Jesus' angels that lift us up to be with him in the air. It is the angels that do this. And I, and I said very quickly in that message that if you're interested in knowing what this looks like, we have an illustration of it in the Old Testament. And so I'm going to give you these passages again. I'll go a little slower. They'll be on the CD um, or the DVD, whatever. But Matthew 24, 31 talks about the, it's the angels that take God's people up. But then in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, we have an actual illustration. What it is, is the prophet, of, prophet Elijah. And it says that suddenly a chariot of fire, a, one of God's chariots, a chariot of fire it's called, appears in the sky. And Elijah the prophet is taken up in something called a whirlwind alive. Here is an illustration of somebody alive being taken up into heaven by something that the scripture calls a chariot of fire. Let me give you some other references about these chariots of fire. Psalm 68, 17, Psalm 104, 3, and then a really big one in Isaiah chapter 66, 15. Now I'm not going to give it away. You look those up on your own and see what kind of a picture it may bring to your mind. Now, as I get ready to wrap this up, the question that I think comes to our minds is you know how could how could somebody get the whole world to follow them like this I mean how I mean there's all these different religions you know you know there's Hinduism and there's Buddhism and there's Judaism and there's Islam and there's Christianity I mean there's such divergence between these global religions and such fierce devotion to them how could anyone pull this off and unite the world well, I'm going to give you one suggestion. I'm not saying, I want you to hear this, I'm not saying this is how it's going to happen. You're welcome to disagree. You're welcome to think I'm crazy. But I'm going to give you this one possible way it could happen just so that if it does, you are forewarned and forearmed. Just suppose when these beings are forced down to earth, it's very physical, just like it was in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2. And when they come down, just as I suggested, they say, we're your 
your Christ. We're your saviors. We're, we're here to protect you. And they show miracles. And then one of them goes into the temple and says, actually, I'm your creator. I'm your God. You see, we created life on your planet long, long ago. We put some of our DNA in you and mixed it with you. And all of your religious writings, every one of them, doesn't matter if you're a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew, all of your religious writings are just your attempts to, to in an imperfect way, write down the experiences off and on that you guys have had with us through the millennia. You see, all your writings are, are, are they've got fragments of truth, but they're not the truth. The truth is, we from above came down long ago to your planet and we started life on your planet. And I was the one that was the leader, so I'm essentially your creator. I'm your God. And we're just more highly evolved beings like you, but we're here now to save you, to help you. What do you think would be the potential impact of that? Listen, since Darwin, since Darwin came along and floated the idea of evolution, that you can have complex creation accidentally, in other words, nothing, or something coming from nothing, and it's believed globally in various ways and forms. I'm not trying to get in a big debate here. But once that idea was embraced, that from an accident you can have complex uh, living beings, well, then that, that, that means certain things have to be true. Listen, if life could evolve to the complex level that it did on this planet, of necessity, based on probability statistics, it would have to have happened somewhere else in the universe. And most intelligent people today, in the, even in the scientific community, will openly say, sure, we believe there's life elsewhere in the universe, but the universe is so vast we might not ever connect. But if it happened here accidentally, surely it happened somewhere else accidentally. So the belief that there is life in the universe is, is firmly embedded in our psyche. And since the 1950s, we of all generations have just been completely saturated with this idea that there's life elsewhere and that there's life wanting to visit. The whole UFO phenomenon, uh, you're welcome to laugh at it. You're welcome to think it's silly. I'm giving you a sincere, a sincere warning, something to consider. I think that that delusion that Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians, the last great delusion that's going to sweep mankind is going to be some form of that these beings are going to show up. They're going to say that they created life on our planet and that they have now from above come down to save us, but there are others that are coming from above down that are going to destroy us. And they're going to be saying that Jesus and his army are the destroyers and they're the saviors. And I, I believe that multitudes would buy that lie. Multitudes would take their Bibles and throw them in a the trash can if they heard that, oh yeah, yeah, all your writings, all your religious writings are just an attempt to understand fragments about us but now you know the truth we're your creators so am I saying that's the way it's going to happen I'm not saying that I'm saying that's one way that it could happen and I believe that we uh, that are alive today need to be really really watchful and aware of this particular scenario all right in closing I had an illustration a couple weeks ago I did with these dominoes and uh, this was a domino record set somewhere in Europe they set up 4,345,000 dominoes is the record. It took nine people months to set these things up. Very complex designs, uh, very amazing, really. So nine people months to set this up. But then when they toppled the first domino, only one, it only took two hours for all 4,345,000 to come down. Prophecy is an awful lot like that. Sometimes it takes a long time for all the pieces to get set up. But then once they start coming down, it can come down very rapidly. We live in a time where the pieces, the prophetic pieces are in place with one exception. And that's that temple that I've been telling you about. It's not there. And Paul said, the day of the Lord, which is Christ's return, where his people are gathered together with him, will not happen until the man of lawlessness comes into the temple claiming that he's God. So the temple is the missing piece. It would be like that big set of dominoes with a big missing piece in the middle. If you started knocking them down, they'd stop because there was a gap. But keep your eyes on the Middle East. Those links that I gave you that are on that, that little supplement sheet, look it up. Look it up and see what, what I'm saying uh, about the individuals that want to bring that temple to pass in our day. All right. A lot of detail, unusual message. Um, in closing... 
it would be wrong of me not to um, say this. If you're here and you've never actually put your faith or trust in Christ, you've never become a Christian, in other words, because that's what it means to become a Christian, nobody can frighten someone <laughs> into becoming a Christian. This message wasn't meant to frighten anybody. This is about the truth. It's just sharing with you the truth about God, life, and so on. But if you're not a Christian, everybody's following somebody. Why wouldn't you follow Christ? He loves you. He created you. He, he died on the cross for my sins and your sins. He rose from the grave proving that he can really forgive our sins and offer eternal life. So if you haven't made your decision to put your faith in Christ, this is a time not to be worried about what anybody else thinks about you. This is a good time to do what I did way back at age 23 and say, I don't give a rip what anybody else does. I'm going to follow Jesus fully forever. I hope if you haven't made that decision, you will. Now, I've got to um, pray, go through the Lord's Supper communion, and get you guys out of here because I've already gone very, very long. So let's pray. Father, we want to thank you that um, you prove that your word alone is trustworthy through your predictive prophecies that tell us in advance uh, so many things that are going to come to pass in life, many of which we've seen in our lifetime. We, we pray that our faith will be strengthened, that you'll give us courage, you'll give us boldness, that if it happens, and, and Lord, we know we may not be that generation, but if we happen to be that generation that will see your coming, that we will be those that give you honor, and we will be those that, that stay courageous and faithful through it all. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.